This lecture is about the bootstrap. The bootstrap is one of the most powerful tools in statistics and can be used for estimating standard errors, for improving predictions, and for performing other types of analyses that are difficult to perform analytically. It probably deserves its own class, but I'll try to go for it through it briefly in just one lecture. The key idea is here is just to treat the sample as if it were the population and sample from that distribution, and then perform analyses as if you had taken a new sample from the population. Like I said, it's good for calculating standard errors, for forming confidence intervals, and performing hypothesis tests. And in the next lecture, we'll learn about how, by averaging over multiple predictors, it can actually improve your prediction accuracy. So this is what we'll call the central dogma of statistics. So suppose you have some population. Imagine this is the population of all people in the United States. We can then take samples of the uh, from that population, say, Sample 1 is a random sample of, say, 100 people. Sample 2 is a different random sample of 100 people, and so forth. If we want to estimate something about this population, imagine, say, for example, we want to estimate a parameter like the mean. Say theta is equal to the mean. We can estimate that parameter in the, in the population by estimating that same parameter in these samples. So, for example, we take the mean in sample 1, the mean in sample 2, and we can use those as estimates of the mean in the overall population. Now the mean might be different in each of these different subsamples, but overall on average it will represent well the mean in the overall population. The idea of the bootstrap is to take our observed sample, so this is imagine say one of those samples of 100 people from the United States, then take repeated samples from that subsample and treat each of those as if it was a brand new sample from the population. We can then recalculate our statistic, say the mean, on each of these samples and use that to get an idea of how variable our estimate of the mean would be if we took new samples from the entire population. This seems like kind of a tricky idea. We're just going to use the sample that we observed, take subsamples of that, and use that to get some information about the variability in the overall sample. However, this idea is actually quite powerful and works very well. So here I'm going to give you an example of how that might work. So what I'm going to do is set the seed and generate 30 normal random variables. Then what I'm going to do is look at a distribution in two different ways. First, I'm going to go through a thousand times and take a sample with replacement from the observed 30 values. So each time I can only generate samples from the 30 va values that I originally generated. Then I'm going to take their mean, and each time I'm going to save that mean to a vector boot mean. The other way that I'm going to look at the distribution is I'm going to generate a brand new set of normal random variables, uh, 30 normal random variables in each of the 1,000 iterations, and take its mean. If I plot uh, the distribution, of the means that I get from resampling my original 30 values, I can plot those in black, and then what I can do is plot in red the values, the distribution of the values I would get by generating 30 new random variables every time. And you can see that these two uh, distributions are remarkably similar to each other. So what we can use is this repeated sampling of the original data to approximate the distribution that we would get from repeated samplings of the entire population. You can also do this with the boot function in the boot package in R. So the way that we do this is we're going to compare again the distribution of the sampled mean versus the boot mean, bootstrapped mean. So the sampled mean is calculated by repeatedly drawing 30 normal random variables and calculating their mean. To get the bootstrap mean we're going to use the boot function. The boot function takes three pieces of information the original data, x, the function that we're going to calculate in each subsample, and the number of times we could, should recalculate that function. The function that we're going to calculate in the subsample should have two arguments, the data, x, and i, a set of indices. So in each case, you're going to get a different random set of indices that are going to be applied, and so what we would like to do is take the mean of the x values corresponding to those indices. If you look at the, va the variable boot mean, 
It gives you the original calculation of the statistic, an estimate of its standard error, and an estimate of its bias. Another thing that we can do is look at the distribution of the bootstrap data versus the distribution of the sample data. So here, I'm plotting the density of the bootstrap means in black. The bootstrap statistics get the value t in the object that's re returned from the boot function. And then I can also overlay the lines that I get from this uh, resampling 30 different values and calculating the mean every time in red. And I can see again these two distributions are very similar. If I sampled a large number of values and did this for a large number of replications, these two distributions would get closer and closer together. So what I'm going to do now is show you how you can use the boot package to calculate confidence intervals without having to make an assumption about normality or any or other strong uh, parametric modeling assumptions. So what I can do here is load the bootstrap library, library boot, then I load the data, this data set on nuclear costs. What I'm going to do is create a linear model rem relating the log of the cost to the date that the reactor was built, and I'm going to use that using the nuclear data. I can now plot the nuclear data versus the log cost, and this is what you see here, and I can add the fitted value that I get from the regression line. Next, what I can do is calculate bootstrap samples and refit the line. First I'm going to do this explicitly. So what I do is I generate a new data frame, nuclear zero, in each of three simulated examples. And what I do is I sample with replacement from the indices of that nuclear data frame. In other words, I take a sample with replacement from the rows of this data frame. I then fit a linear model using the subsample data and then I can plot the fit that I get from each different random sampling of the data. And in each case, I get a slightly different regression line with a slightly different slope and a slightly different intercept. So one thing that I could do is try to calculate the distribution of estimated values for, uh, that we would expect if we would sample from this population and recalculate the linear model coefficients. So the way that I'm going to do that is with the, again with the boot function. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass to boot the nuclear data. I'm also going to tell it to do a thousand replications. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell it to calculate this statistic BS. And I'm going to also send it one additional parameter, parameter the formula parameter, which is the formula that I'm going to use in the model. Then what I do is I, the BS function takes the data, so in this case nuclear, and so what it does is it subsamples that data according to the random indices here. Then it fits a linear model using the formula that I've passed from in the boot function, and each time it returns the coefficients that it gets from fitting this linear model. So in other words, the combination of this boot function and this BS function generates 1,000 simulated linear model fits where I've resampled the data set with replacement. I can then plot a density or a distribution of the estimated slope terms across all 1,000 sampled data sets. So here's the distribution of the slope terms. I can also plot where the actual observed slope term is, and that's here in the middle. So with the bootstrap, I actually have an idea of what the estimated value is and what its estimated distribution is across repeated samplings from the population. I can use those values to calculate confidence intervals for the uh, uh, linear model regression term. And the way that I do that is I can use boot.ci to calculate those confidence intervals. So what that boot.ci does is it applies uh, the confidence interval calculation to the results that you get from the bootstrap model. And so what you can get then are confidence intervals for the regression terms using this uh, fit from the bootstrap model. 
These confidence intervals can be come in di several different forms depending on the type of flavor of bootstrap that you do. And so depending on the type that you're interested in, you may be interested in one or more of these. You can look at the boot.ci uh, information to learn more about what the difference is between each of these different types of confidence intervals. But all of these confidence intervals are less parametric than the assumptions that you would make if you make the confidence intervals from the confint function directly applied to the linear model. Another thing that we can do is bootstrap from a particular submodel with the goal of trying to perform a hypothesis test. So we talked about hypothesis testing and p-values in previous lectures. Here's how you calculate a hypothesis test with the bootstrap. So what we do is calculate the studentized residuals from this linear model using the rstudent function. We can also calculate the fitted values that we would get if we only included an intercept term. In other words, this is the fitted values you get when you fit a straight line to the data. Then what you can do is append these residual values and these flat fitted values to the data set nuclear. We now change our BS function that we're going to pass to boot in a very uh, basic way. So what we do is we calculate the coefficients of a linear model fit where the outcome is the flat fitted values you get if you only fit an intercept term plus a random bootstrap sample according to these indices of the residuals. So we get the flat line plus residual of variation and we're going to fit that in a linear model related to the date that uh, the samples were taken. So what is this doing? This uh, component here is generating an outcome variable where there's no trend relating cost to um, date. And that's because this fit zero does not include a date term in the linear model. And then the residuals are just random variation. So what we're getting here are coefficients that we would estimate if there was no relationship between cost and date. We can then pass to the boot function our new nuke data set, the data set including the residuals and the fit zero so that they can be found by the BS function, the BS function, and the number of replications to be performed, in this case 1000. What we can then do is plot the distribution of the coefficients that we would get if there was no relationship between cost and um, date. In this case, the distribution here is centered on zero, as we would expect. The observed coefficient that we estimate from the real data is indicated by this red line here. We could calculate an empirical p-value by summing the area to the right of this red line underneath the distribution. We could calculate a two-sided p-value by reflecting this line also around zero and also calculating the area on this side of the curve as well. We can do that using the formula uh, for an empirical v-value of 1 plus the sum of the absolute value of the uh, bootstrapped statistics greater than the absolute value of our observed statistics divided by b plus 1. The way that we do that, where b is equal to the number of bootstrap samples, the way that we do that is we calculate b equal to the d dimension of the bootstrapped statistics. So this is the number of bootstrap samples that we have. Then we calculate the sum of the absolute value of our bootstrap statistics. So this is again the bootstrapped object results. t is the bootstrap statistics. In this case we estimated two coefficients so we need to take the second column of that t and we calculate the number of times that's greater than the absolute value of the coefficient for the regression slope that we get from the original model. And then we divide by b plus 1. In this case, the p-value is 0 0.1838. Of course, this would vary depending on the, the seed that you set when you calculate the bootstrap samples, since that's a random or stochastic process. This suggests that there may be some evidence that there's a difference, but it's not very strong. You can also use the bootstrap in general to do more complicated things than just linear models. 
So for example, calculating the confidence interval for the sample median is a very difficult thing to do analytically. However, you can use the bootstrap to do it in a very straightforward way. So suppose we calculate uh, or we uh, generate again 30 normal random variables and what we can do is we can generate two distributions. One where we repeatedly generate these 30 normal random variables and take their median and another where we repeatedly sample from this set of observations x and calculate a median function which is just equal to the median of the x values for a random subsample defined by these indices i. We can replicate each 1000 times and then look at the two distributions. In red here you see the distribution that you get from repeatedly bootstrapping from the same sample and calculating the median. Here's the distribution that you get when you sample from a new data set every time and calculate the median. Here we have a nonlinear statistic, so these two distributions are somewhat different from each other. We might need a slightly larger sample size or slightly more, a slightly large number of replications in order for these two distributions to be very similar. And in fact, there are some functions that are, should not be bootstrapped at all. So here's an example. Suppose now that we calculate the max of the number of the random variable, of the sort of the generated normal random variables. So we have these 30 normal random variables, and we can generate 30 of them every single time and calculate their max. Each time we'll get a different max because it's a different, 30 set, of, uh, different set of 30 random variables. We can also boot, do the same thing with the bootstrap, here applying it to the one fixed data set, x, and taking the max of the bootstrap samples. Now remember that the bootstrap max can never be larger than the maximum that we've observed for the original data set x. Furthermore, it will often be the same value since one of the values, whatever the largest value is in our bootstrap sample, will be one of the 30 values that appear here. If you look at the distribution that you get from repeatedly generating new data sets and taking the max, you can see that this distribution is very spread out and they're including some very large values. Uh, that uh, correspond to the maximum value. If you look at the distribution, uh, on the other hand, of the maximum value from the bootstrap samples, you can see that it never gets to be larger than the maximum value we observed in the original data set, and that there appear to be these spikes. In other words, this distribution is not the same as this distribution and should not be used to approximate it. In general, this makes a little bit of sense. If we only have 30 values, we won't know what a new maximum what the distribution of the maximum value of a new sample will be because we can never be larger than the observed value in the original data set. So some notes and further resources on the bootstrap. It can be useful for complicated statistics and there's even more complicated examples that uh, I haven't talked about here today where the bootstrap can be useful. You should be careful near the boundaries or for highly nonlinear functions. So for example, the max and min should not be uh, targets of the bootstrap. Brian Caffo has some very nice bootstrap notes, which, you can which I'm linking to here through Johns Hopkins OpenCourseWare. You can also see a couple of very nice basic tutorials on the boot package. An introduction to the bootstrap is a very nice introductory tutorial on the bootstrap um, by the authors of the original bootstrap paper. However, it's, it, you have to pay for it. Confidence limits on phy phylogenies is an example of an application of the bootstrap to a very complicated function and might be of interest to people who particularly are interested in genetics or um, evolutionary theory.